Okay, hello, it is Tuesday 22nd of December. This is the second installment of the Amplified Trading kind of look ahead for 2021. Yesterday, we had a head of trading, Piers Curran, and he talked us through from a top level macro perspective, his outlook for the Forex market, but definitely got right into some of the details about things like the virus, the vaccine, Biden, the Fed, and these types of things. Today, we're gonna to move away from the FX market and we're going to focus on the equity market. So with me, I've got um, a bit of a mix, really, from the Amplified team, because I really wanted to take um, perhaps a bit of a different angle than what we normally would. So a lot of the macro, I think, was covered yesterday very eloquently by peers. So I don't think we need to go too much into that. But I have got, obviously, Sam here, who's the head of trader development. And, and Sam does trade actively, uh, things like the S&P over a medium, more long-term perspective. But then we've also got Tim, who's who's definitely into the down NASDAQ, more short-term short intraday. Uh, and then we've got Eddie. And Eddie, for those, again, just to familiarize yourself uh, with Eddie, he, he's the head of Amplify Me, which is part of our technology division within the, the bigger, broader group of Amplify. Uh, and he's very much involved in spearheading that with the work with business schools and universities and so on. So... Um, Eddie's definitely looks at the world in a slightly different way, perhaps than, than the rest of the guys, because he's a lot more focused on um, the more kind of micro level uh, individual companies, sectors. And that's really where I'd like this conversation to go, just to add a bit of a different um, kind of angle to things, which is um, perhaps probably most prudent to have a bit of a review on and how the market played out for, for 2020. And perhaps let's just, um, I'll start with the top level with this chart here. Um, so hopefully everyone can see that. It's just an annotated chart of the S&P 500. Uh, so I'm sure Eddie can uh, give us the kind of more microscopic level of, of how individual companies and sectors have performed, but from a top level, uh, quite, a phenomenal year. I mean, with with Tim and Sam, I don't know how you felt back in March with trying to then really with great confidence say, yeah, we're going to finish at 3,700 year out <laughs> when we were in like, what, the 20th of March, just before we hit the bottom on the 23rd. How did you guys feel at that time? Can you remember? Well, I remember saying to you, and and I, I can't remember, I haven't got the Dow Jones in front of me, but I remember saying something like, if Dow Jones trades at 21,000, I'll work the rest of the year for free. And then <laughs> <laughs> two days later, it, it did come down. So, I mean, listen, that that few week period was intense. But I do remember having conversations similar to how we are having now that we were all of the, the, the belief that it was going to recover. It was going to make a new all time high. Um, and and it has and more. Um, but, to, you know, to have held through that, would have been would have been hard you know especially if you're you know medium longer term and it would have been the right thing probably to come out but that said you know the discounts that were offered in in march april were you know once in a generation you know looking back in hindsight as they were in 2008 so yeah it was in a very intense period it was um yeah i mean not much sleep was had in that uh, in that few weeks tim in terms of your kind of your year as a whole was um, you know, obviously sympathetic to the subject matter we're discussing here, but sure. I mean, was, was that a period of, of great opportunity or has the opportunity been more the kind of recovery, at least on Wall Street, perhaps not Main Street yet, but with the recovery we've had over the last several months to the push to all time highs again? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, for me, the, the first, the first half of the year was really trading the volatility and the downside on oil, putting in record days for me personally, especially on the gap down. Uh, that was a record day for me. And from trading Volmageddon in 2018, in February, early March, I knew that like when you're in these uber highly, highly volatile um, scenarios, you, you don't really want to be super active in trying to catch uh, levels on the S&P because it's just going to wipe all of them, wipe the floor with all your key support and resistance. Even if you have good levels, you know, just a, a, a 50 or a hundred tick 
spike in like a second is nothing and you're just going to get eaten alive so i i stayed out of the way of a lot of the downside um i was actually buying long equities uh for some of the stay at home names i mean i have been long netflix for around five or six years now so i was adding to that position i was also initiating new positions in zoom um as we were coming down hard so i was really playing the you know the the tech names for that you know that would benefit and i was definitely identifying uh, some interesting levels on monthly bar charts across like energy equities and stuff like that and um you know then looking for optional plays should we start to recover so i wasn't like trying to be a hero and nail you know some monster shorts at all well, look, that, that sets, a, sets us up nicely, I think, for Eddie to really give us a bit more insight into that because we kind of started to open up the door towards some of those pandemic plays and so on. So, Eddie, uh, uh, I'll hand it over to you from here. Yeah, I think it's always just worth revisiting that kind of March period because it was so scary, volatile and uncertain. And I think if we flash back to that, those few days in the office, uh, and I did that video uh, of that. It was actually t term top sector trends for trading coronavirus, obviously, uh, paying respect to how serious the virus was at that time. Uh, but I outlined a few characteristics, and it, I, th I believe the video was on March 16th or March 20th, some something around that time. So I didn't quite time the bottom uh, when the Fed stepped in on the 23rd of March and started buying all the credit. Um, but attractive characteristics I kind of uh, laid out, low leverage, strong balance sheets, secular tailwinds, technology, strong and stable cash flows, a high ability to service interest payments, so high interest coverage ratio, so generating earnings to cover those interest expense, high cash flow to debt, and a strong ability to withstand temporary demand uh, and sh shortfalls and supply chain disruption. I think that really is just describing tech, isn't it? Uh, I think if you look at 2020 and why tech's kind of led the charge and now it makes up such a high proportion of the S&P and that really was uh, the key driver. So some of those names that I outlined on that slide, Pinterest, Zoom, Adobe, Alibaba, Slack, all, all pretty good picks. Uh, I did have Lyft and Uber in there, which were not, not so good in terms of uh, you know, the, the shutdowns and the sensitivity to travel and things like that. Uh, but I think definitely you wanted to stay away from uh, those cyclical names in terms of, you know, the airlines, the hotels, anything linked to travel uh, and traditional economic activity. I think they were always gonna gonna see some see some damage. Particularly, you know, I, I think Tim could probably speak to this. Those kind of oil companies as well. Just that inherently they are extremely leveraged um, in terms of being tied to the obviously the oil producing nature, but they took on a huge amount of debt. And if you were looking for kind of best in class premier balance sheets that wasn't in oil or for the for the most part that was in your your amazons your googles that just have so many gears and levers to pull if it's search engines if it's youtube if it's uh you know zoom all of those plays were, were really uh driven by the balance sheet quality and if you look at some of the the kind of charts in terms of what kind of factors and things led the charge. It was those extremely high quality balance sheet names, high growth, momentum. And obviously this was uh, accelerated ridiculously by the Fed stepping in and really giving the green light to credit investors, which is, if you remember where a lot of the problem was, you know, the credit spreads uh, driving up dramatically, a lot of distress in those markets. If you remember the credit default swaps and the CDX index and things like that, now we we see credit spreads, at, you know, really record lows. Uh, so a lot of certainties return to the market, and investors are feeling confident about that kind of reflation trade. Um, so if I can speak to kind of the outlook in terms of what we've seen, let's say through November and things like that, I think now the market is really looking for leadership, uh, and I think tech and the fang names particularly did uh, provide that leadership in 2020. Uh, and as we saw really starting, you know, three months ago, uh, which is what um, Ants got up, I think energy is up 
now on a three month basis at a sector level. Uh, it's still down 35% year to date. So there is some unloved names there. Uh, and I think if you are looking at energy, um, there is still, I think, some opportunity um, for those high quality names, uh, especially if they are trying to uh, appeal to that ESG uh, kind of thematic trend um, that I think will continue to dominate as well. But I do think, yeah, heading into Q1, I think we are looking for leadership uh, in terms of the breadth of the rally uh, and those kind of cyclical sectors looking to, to outperform. And it's interesting that you mentioned the, 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 you know, the best in class balance sheets in the ener energy industry. Sorry. Just get this uh, to walk off. You know, I think in the oil industry, well, energy, North America specific, there were a lot of sort of mid-tier companies that it's, it's been a long story of them being really geared in a very delicate way, highly financed on their operations. And so when, you know, the Piper came a call in over COVID, you saw a huge amount, as you do in these low oil price environments of um, mergers and acquisitions. But it's always the, the the top tier integrated companies like Shell, BP, Chevron, ConocoPhillips, um, that that are just going to survive, and they're going to be the ones doing the acquisitions. And so when we started to really prove a bottom, you know, for me, getting into equity plays like BP, Shell, um, you know, just makes so much sense. Yeah, and I was just going back to this heat map and looking to kind of move the, the conversation into some other areas. And this is looking at the last one month performance. Uh, and here you can see, you know, there's a couple of names obviously that stand out, um, whether they're tied to, to drugs and, and vaccines, perhaps in the case of Eli Lilly, Disney, Netflix with COVID developments or, or Apple with the uh, substantial increase in their iPhone kind of demand that they're anticipating. But I just wanted to see if there's any comment on the banking sector. Uh, we had the stress test come out of the Fed not that long ago, a couple of days ago, in fact. They were talking about uh, giving top banks conditional green light to buy back shares again in Q1. What, what does that actually mean for these stocks? And, and if you were looking at that as a sector, how, how do you interpret that for somebody who's maybe not familiar with the kind of the buybacks and, and what that really does mean from the Fed? Yeah, I think um, banks is, uh, and financials more generally are a very interesting kind of topic going into next year, because if we flash back to what we saw even heading into the kind of COVID crisis, they were at absolute and relative valuation lows. Uh, and obviously they got beaten up, uh, probably rightly so, in March, just because their loans, uh, the, you know, uh, more the more traditional banks like your JP Morgan's, I guess, City, Bank of America, particularly Wells Fargo, um, their loan books, right, were linked to the real economy. Uh, and as we saw, we saw outperformance from tech uh, and super underperformance from the real economy. Um, and there was a lot of uh, worry about, you know, defaulting, you know, uh, the, the loans that potentially could default, you know, tied to the real estate sector, hospitality, um, restaurants, you know, all of those names. So they put aside a huge amount of loan provisions uh, in the billions for like JP Morgan, for example. Um, and now, basically, a lot of them were saying the whole time, but particularly now that they were kind of overcapitalized. Uh, and I think it's a big nod from the Fed in terms of the overall risk sentiment that now they're saying, look, you're able to now use that capital, distribute to, to shareholders. Um, the banks, again, is an interesting one. Do they then deploy that capital this year? Is it through buybacks, which lowers the shares outstanding, increases their earnings per share, obviously uh, positive for the banks. Um, there's some good, you know, from a valuation perspective, still some, some opportunities there. But we do need to also remember on the flip side that the Fed came out, obviously, on Wednesday, super low rates until at least 2023, which is bad um, for their net interest margins, uh, for example. But again, those, those banks uh, that are tied to the investment banking activities, uh, like you'll probably see from Q4 earnings uh, when they come out next, uh, next quarter, you know, IPO, so equity capital markets growth, M&A has returned as markets have become more sanguine. You know, they generate a huge amount of fees uh, from those areas. 
Um, so those banks, again, can tie to that uh, investment banking division trading, of course, uh, that they did so well. They would be my pick over those kind of deeper value names. But I do expect those to kind of get some love uh, as well as we see. But again, all of this is all tied to the vaccine. You know, you can say whatever you want. If we do see, I think now it's all about mutations. If we do see mutations, um, if we do see the vaccines unable to satisfy, you know, uh, and cure the new mutations, then whatever we talk about is pretty pretty irrelevant, and we'll see a flip from that reflation trade back to the to the work from home, COVID COVID compliant stocks. So 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 how this goes out to everyone? How how do you go about then? positioning here there's a there's as what Piers was describing yesterday there's a base case which is that the vaccines are effective they are deployed the cumulative value of all of the other pharmaceutical companies coming then to the point of distribution is going to happen as the months roll on so do you position yourself if we're talking stocks only you position yourself in a way to prepare for that potential tail risk or do you just remain agile enough to switch things up should then the situation change? How would you yeah, I think, I, I, think, I think you've definitely got to stay tactical uh, in, your, in your approach because as soon as we get back positive vaccine announcements, you see a green light for those reflation trades that we talked about in terms of the cyclical industrials, materials, small, small to mid caps, commodity stocks. They'll perform extremely well. Um, in that kind of reflation trade. And then again, with the stimulus, you, you're kind of looking at higher yields there, um, which would obviously benefit those names. Um, I do expect value, that kind of factor to, I would say, outperform or try and find leadership in that kind of Q1. But as soon as we see that kind of mutation, um, that would be to the detriment of that. And you would see a rotation back to, I guess, those COVID compliance. In terms of how to... Uh, position yourself i know tim tim's going to like this comment uh, as he has in the past the dividend names um you know if you're talking multi-asset class the yields are let's say on 10 year look extremely unattractive and the bonds look very overvalued so if you're looking for uh almost a, an option on the reflation trade plus dividend income then those high dividend names are going to look really attractive um because they kind of provide you income um you know, if, if there is some, let's say, uh, drawbacks on the, on, the re, on the mutation of the virus, but also then give you a, almost a call option on the reflation trade itself. Um, and that's, you know, what you hear from kind of uh, credit investors as well, you know, high yield. Again, you're not going to get the price appreciation, for example, uh, that you probably did this year because of the, the Fed stepping in, things like that. Um, but you will get that, that income. Um, so, you uh, overall, uh, I'm my base case is I'm positive on equities. I think it's hard not to be with the potential base case of let's say vaccine rollouts. At, you, you'd think by Q3. I think that's my base case because I do think there will be blips, uh, just like Piers, uh, meant, you know, kind of alluded to uh, before. Um, but overall, with the Fed as well, there. You know, supporting markets. You've got the stimulus packages. Okay, it was slightly disappointing yesterday, but the support is there. Even with the credit facilities, they didn't even really get scratched this year. You know, so the Fed is there to support it. Um, will we see the gains we saw this year? Let's say from the March lows, probably not. Uh, I think they will be more muted. But overall, I would be positive on on equities going into the into the next year. It's a, that, that leads us up for Sam then. I know Sam's not shy of putting his name on a couple of S&P year-end calls. So do you want to bring up the S&P, Sam? And yeah, let me bring it up. I'm a, I'm a lot more positive than <laughs> you there, maybe. But listen, you know, this time last year, I would absolutely would have, well, probably said it would have ended where it is, but not the journey that, that got us there. Um, and a lot of people, I guess, would have had pie in their face in, in quarter one and two. Um, thanks to Corona, but yeah, I, I for me, I, I just put it in our chat. Where where do I where do people see end of year twenty twenty one? I mean, I, I think early on we're going to take out the four thousand handle 
on the S&P. I think there's going to be pullbacks, like Eddie said, blips along the way due to, to vaccine developments or lack of. I think that's going to happen and that gives opportunity for people to get in. There's a lot of money still on the side here. Um, and also, Corona only sent stocks down 35%. Yeah, I think we we push on big time next year. Uh, so end of year, it's hard to to say where we finish the year, but I think we we get to about four two, four thousand two hundred, um, and then it's kind of how we go from there. But yeah, I, I I'd say, and I don't really feel that's me putting my my neck on the line. I, I feel that that comes relatively quickly. It's just whether we can sustain a push uh, above there or, or not. At some point as well in in our lifetime, I think I think Dow Jones is is going to get to uh, get to the big big hundred thousand as well. Um, not anytime soon, but <laughs> in our lifetime, a hundred thousand is coming. That is that is the call of the century, right? <laughs> <laughs> heard, heard it here Literally, the call of the century to come. Yeah, uh, but yeah, I think hundred thousand comes. I, I think I think the coronavirus lows and in all US stocks will never be seen again. Like the 2008 lows from the GFC. I think we'll never see, what was that? 2162, I don't think we'll ever see again. For, for me to practically, um, actually where for me to put money to work over these, the electric car themes at the moment, so I'm looking at iDrive, I'm looking at Hale, these are ETFs, EV ETFs. And it's sort of a set and forget trade. I mean, whereby you're you're really backing the overall theme and you don't need to be essentially taking outright risk across, say, Tesla, where you might have a liquidation event down 20% on the day and you're thinking, well, you know, holy hell, what, what's happening here? You know, kind of smoothing out that that trade with a basket of EV stocks is, is just a nicer trade for me. And there are a few, there's about three or four key ETFs out there for EV. Uh, yeah yeah i think um two two sectors i guess or areas that are particularly uh, going to be interesting and interesting over to the, the next kind of three to five years is genomics and kind of that gene editing uh kind of play to you know cure you know your sickle cell diseases and your your potentially cancers um you know the, the computing power available now um in terms of that kind of gene ed editing you know, they've got power that they haven't seen before. Uh, and, you know, you, you see names, uh, particularly in the, the ARC ETF, uh, which is uh, Kathy Wood's um, ETF. Names like Editas, CRISPR, um, that have done extremely well over the last month or so, up 100, 200%. Um, so that, that's a, quite a big theme that you'll start to hear a lot more about. And I do think as well, uh, as we have seen that move online, is uh, kind of security and online security uh, and, and an increased spending of businesses uh, on that security because like we saw with Washington being hacked the other day, uh, I don't think there's enough focus uh, on that market yet. So that, there are two things that I'm looking at, particularly the gene editing one. And I definitely by any means do not fancy myself as a biologist, um, but you can, you, know, you can look at it just like the vaccines at a pretty high level and see the potential there. Um, so that's two kind of areas I'm, I'm looking at at the moment.